Hello, everyone. Welcome to CSA Conversations. Uh, our guest today is Peter Hinson. Uh, thank you for being with us, Peter, today. First My pleasure. It's, it's really nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Peter is a serial entrepreneur, advisor, and keynote speaker uh, on the topics of uh, radical innovation, leadership, and the impact of all things digital on society and business. He is also the author of five best-selling business books. Uh, correct me if uh, I'm wrong in terms of the number, because I counted the five in terms of the books. <laughs> <laughs> It's five indeed. Uh. The five. The, the latest one is The Phoenix and the Unicorn, which has been published in 2020. Uh, the Day After Tomorrow is like the movie, I think. The, the, the title of the movie was very similar. Yeah, we had to clear the rights, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the Network Always Wins, The New for Normal, Explore the Limits of the Digital World, uh, which you actually published that book in 2010, which is interesting. Yep, 10 years ago. Yep. About the new normal nowadays. And then Business and IT Fusion in 2008. Um, thank you for being with us again. And uh, so many interesting questions pop up in my mind, uh, to be honest, when I saw your work and your research thank about you. the area of innovation, basically. Uh, probably you will make us navigate into the deep waters of you know, what radical innovation and creativity means. But I would like to start about the term, probably many of us confuse the term innovation and creativity. Uh, what's the difference of being innovative? And you also describe different paths of innovation um, in your... In well, your I mean, story. innovation has been something that I've been passionate about, you know, most of my professional life. I, I'm, I'm a technologist by training. I'm an engineer. Uh, but I did startups for most of the early part of my career. Uh, this is back in the days when startups weren't as hip and as you know, fashionable as they are today. But for almost 15 years, I did technology startups. Um, I would start a company, find something interesting, start from scratch, and then develop that and, and hopefully see it grow. And I had the chance to do three of those uh, in the first 15 years when I was active. And I love doing that because I love to go into uncharted waters and pick up something that is completely new and then figure out how to build a business and find the market for it. And I think what has happened now is that I've seen the world escalate and evolve. And I think the, the pace of change that we see in many markets, in many geographies, and in many businesses is actually accelerating. And that means that if you look at innovation, then actually making small steps isn't enough anymore. As a startup, you know that because as a startup, making baby steps means that you're dead because you won't be fast enough. But if you're a traditional player in a traditional industry, incremental innovation used to be okay. I mean, it was still good enough to actually catch up with the changes in the market. But in 2021, that doesn't work anymore. We're now in a pace of change that is escalating and companies are not going to survive with making small baby steps. They have to make the big leaps. They have to look at the radical innovation. And if you position that, then I think creativity is one of those elements, one of those ingredients which is necessary for organizations, companies, or even individuals to actually help reinvent themselves. So in a way, I think innovation is really the big picture. It's you know, the challenge that we have as, as a company, as an organization, but even as a country, as a society. And then creativity is one of those mechanisms, is one of those ingredients, one of those opportunities that you need to develop. But creativity, in my opinion, is just the little element. There are so many different elements if you really want to focus on that big picture of innovation. And certainly, if you want to go beyond the baby steps and think about radical innovation. Mm -hmm. And I think many different uh skill set are required to be a radical innovator. It's not, uh, it's easy to say you need to be a radical innovator, but I think many companies need those skills as well in their individuals. And as well as if you start a new company yourself, what, what do you think those new skills can be, especially nowadays when we are handling 
the issues related to pandemic, to climate change, and all those challenging issues? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. I mean, as, as you mentioned, I, I wrote that book, The New Normal, 10 years ago. Um, now I'm not so sure if I would still use the title because everybody has been using The New Normal. But in those days, I focused on one element, which was digital. And what we saw in the last 10 years is the world became digital. Digital became the new normal. And oh, thank God we had that in the pandemic, because imagine having to live through what we lived through, you know, with you know, a dial-up modem from 20 years ago, that that wouldn't have worked. So digital became the new normal. But I think what is a danger with some companies that they say, yes, digital, very important. We need to do a digital transformation. And they think if they do that, check, it's done. I think we're now getting into what I call the never normal, which is a world of constant change, where it's not just technological, but ecological, biological, geopolitical, and even social. And what companies need to do is they need to probably act faster if they want to not just survive the never normal, but actually thrive on the never normal, take advantage of the never normal. And as you pointed out, you need um, an enormous, you know, different set of components to be able to deal with that. I think the number one issue is that you need a top-down commitment to actually take this seriously and to do something about it. One of the most frustrating things is, you know, I've been doing a lot of public speaking in the last 10 years, is that, you know, sometimes you get invited by a company and you can talk to their leadership team or their top management. And often they have like a strategic offsite where, you know, they think about the future, you know, very, very hard. You know? And I love being at those events because then you can challenge people and, and trigger ideas and get them motivated and stimulated. And then, you know, after a session like that, you think, wow, I'm, I'm really curious what they're going to do with that. And then a year later, I would get an invite to come back to that company. And I think, wow, that's, that's interesting. I want to see what they've done. And you go there and they've done nothing. Huh? And you think, why? Huh? And they said, oh, but it was so much fun to listen to you. It was like, you know, one of those scary movies, you know, but then you go back to the comfort of your house and think, oh, it wasn't real. And I think this is, you know, a, probably a scary thing at the moment because the world is changing quite rapidly and it's not just digital. I think there would be uh, probably a mistake for companies to say, yes, digital check done. Let's go back to the old normal. We're getting into this never normal. And that's where you need that wide set of ingredients. Top leadership commitment is important. You need to figure out a strategy to deal with radical innovation. You need to organize for radical innovation. You need to think about the structures in your company and how to organize for that. You need to think about the mindset. You need to think about the cultural dimensions of dealing with radical innovation. And you probably need a different way of thinking about leadership going forward. And those are the areas that I love to focus on because I think it would be very unwise and very naive for people to think that after pandemic, it's just going to be peace and quiet and we're going to go back to the old normal. I think that would be, for many companies, a terrible disappointment. I do understand. It's it's scary though, uh, but well, we scary and and exciting at the same time. And I think the, the the biggest challenge I think that we have is that many companies are not prepared for that. Also on the on the on the on the leadership side, I've been teaching at a number of business schools now for the last ten years: London Business School, MIT Sloan, ESMT in Berlin. And I love being there. And don't get me wrong; I mean they're wonderful institutions. But if I teach at an MBA program, for example, the first thing I will say to the MBA students is, congratulations, this is the perfect preparation for the 20th century. Because many of the things that we are teaching managers and leaders today are things that were very applicable to the last century. But if you want to really thrive on this never normal, take advantage of this volatility and figure out how to really, really guide your organization into this ever-changing, volatile, uncharted waters, we're going to need new skills and new capabilities. And I think this is also where... We have to give up the idea that, you know what, there's going to be the magical Harvard Business Review article where we can read the seven steps that we need to implement and we'll be fine. 
that doesn't work anymore. It's going to be continuously learning. It's going to be probably learning as we go along. And we're going to have to reinvent our learning capabilities, maybe even more profoundly than just you know, very specific skills inside an organization. But you're right. It, it looks scary. But at the same time, I get excited by that. And I see a lot of companies who actually see this as an enormous opportunity, as a set of challenges that can actually help them get stronger. And that's what I try to write about in the Phoenix and the Unicorn as well. I mean, the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of applause for the unicorns because every conference you went to, it was Uber and Airbnb. And you could see people in the audience saying, yeah, nice, but we're not Uber. You know, we're not Airbnb. And I think there's now an opportunity for traditional businesses to reinvent themselves, probably, you know, borrow a few tricks from the unicorn. Yeah, that's for sure. But that's what I call a phoenix. This is a, a traditional company in a traditional business capable of reinventing itself. Mm -hmm. And we see some of those examples. I mean, some of the big examples, because that's what I love to use, because that's what everybody sees. And, and I think a company like Disney, for example, I mean, Disney had a really bad year last year. I mean, the, the movie theaters were closed, the theme parks were closed. But uh, we became uh, a member of Disney Plus the moment that it arrived in our country. And Disney Plus is a completely new reinvention of Disney because they reach out to the consumers directly. It's a completely new business model and operating model. And I love this, that they were able to get to 100 million subscribers in almost a year. And I find that absolutely fascinating. And to see an old company like Disney reinventing itself, I think is a true sign that phoenixes are very real, um, that they are capable of reinventing themselves and coming out stronger. And I believe that after a decade of the unicorns, we're now going to have a decade of the phoenixes. And I think that's, that's going to be very exciting for many, many different businesses out there. Yeah. That's interesting. And you are using a term called vaccine, but it's a different vaccine, right? It's V-A-C-I-N-E. Uh, there's no double C. There's only one C. So what is your vaccine? Uh, well, the vaccine success? is something that I, I put together, of course, you know, very topical in, in COVID times, but, but it's an incorrectly spelled six-letter word. The V is for velocity. The world is moving faster. We will have to move faster. I mean, uh, this is something that we are picking up. But the A is for agility, because I think agility is even more important than raw speed. It's being able to look at the water and respond. It's being able to understand and be resilient. So V is for velocity, A is for agility. The C is for creativity. I mean, we talked about this earlier. I think we have to tap into the creative potential of everyone in the organization. And the I is for innovation. I think this is no longer a luxury. It's product innovation, market innovation, service innovation, model innovation, and probably all of it at the same time. But the last two letters in the vaccine is the N for networking and the E for experimentation. And the N for networking is, I think if people are going to write the history book of the 21st century, they won't refer to this era as the digital age. I think they will refer to this as the network age, because I don't think we live in an age where people are capable to turn things on and off. I think we live in the age of networks. And if I look at my children, they're not digital natives, they're network natives. They have learned how to behave and learn and thrive and socialize in the network. And I think this is interesting because as markets are turning into networks, we're going to have to figure out as companies how to move at the speed of the network. I think it's the only way to actually survive. And the last one, so velocity, agility, creativity, innovation, networking is the E for experimentation. This is the, the time to try to have the, the guts, the psychological safety to actually be open-minded, maybe take a little bit more risk but figure out how to experiment faster, how to try, and maybe even how to fail faster, but learn from our failures. And I think this is probably the most difficult because if you talk to companies, they say, yeah, speed, important, agility, very important, creativity, innovation, super, super important. Networking, yeah, okay, they understand that we live in the age of ecosystems and platforms, they have to do something. But experimentation, that's a big 
shift because it means that maybe you're going to have to give up some control to get more capability of reinvention. And I believe that this is one of the most crucial elements to actually get right because we will have to figure out how to be more open-minded to try things and to experiment. And that's, a, you know, I think, a huge cultural challenge going forward. Well, wonderful. And uh, th there are so many insights that we are getting from you. And I believe uh, I will look forward to listen to your webinars uh, when you come to Turkey on the stage or on the screen. I'm not sure nowadays we can do both, I think, at the same time. Yeah, and I, I think it's probably going to be very much a hybrid type of environment. I mean, somebody I heard somebody say is that, you know, a classical conference was, you know, a person on a stage talking to an audience And then COVID came along and we went from making theater to making television. And I think there's a world for both. I think we're going to have theater and television and maybe sometimes combined. And I, I do believe that hybrid is going to be the way that we think about the future in many, many different aspects, including, you know, being able to, uh, to reach and touch an audience and to inspire them. Yeah, I believe so as well. Uh, so, Peter, thank you so much for being with us today and hope to My see pleasure. you and meet you uh, in the future, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thanks thank for having you. me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.